All right, are we are we live? I think we are. Uh, I'm going to be doing this quickly because <laughs> I left this until late, and I want to make sure it gets online. So as a warning before I start this, um, I might not hit everything. Also, I plan to make little mini lectures. This is not going to be mini. This is going to be a big chunk of lecture. I'm sorry. I don't know exactly how long it's going to be. I'm not going to pause very much because I know you can pause it as much as you need to and go back and review. I'll also put the PowerPoints up in case you find that useful. So this is probability. Now for chapter 2 this year, we're only going to do 2.1 and I think it's 2.5. Is that right? That's all. So just 2.1 and then probability distributions, which I believe is 2.5. This won't cover everything in the book, unfortunately, but it does cover uh, a lot of good important things. If you see any, something irrelevant that's not in 2.1 or 2.5, feel free to ignore it. So why do we do probability? Because of inference. We're doing descriptive stats now, but later we're going to do inferential stats. Inferential statistics are what we use um, when we're trying to make guesses about how our, s our sample values relate to population values. We can see our sample values, but we can't see. We don't have access to the population values. So we need probability to make guesses about how likely it is that, you know, that our values uh, are match those in the population. So we need to know some basic probability for that and for a few other things. So here's the kind of question, you don't have to know the answer to this or follow it perfectly, but this is the kind of question that we would answer with probability once we start doing inference. And we'll do that and we'll do something very much like this in a, in a couple of weeks here, a few weeks. So imagine that you know that the IQ of 56 children, a sample of children, not all children, who live near some toxic waste, um, the mean is 97.3. So your question is, is the toxic waste affecting their IQ? Now, the mean of 97.3 is just a little below 100. The population average for most IQ score uh, tests is they manipulate the test so that the average is 100. So 97.3 is just 0 0.7 IQ points below. The standard deviation is 15. So it's a teeny, teeny fraction of one standard deviation below. So how is that possible to think that they could have an average lower IQ? Um, so how can we come to any conclusion? Well, we can't know if the toxic waste actually affected their IQ, but we could, we could find out whether their IQ was significantly lower. In other words, if 0.7 points is low enough in this sample that we might think, oh, this is an actual real difference. It's a small difference, but it's real. The, this is something that is happening probably to all children, not just to these here. So we can make an inference about the population based on this sample. So the expected mean IQs of 56 randomly selected children from the general population who have no unusual problems, they wouldn't all have a mean of, of 100, right? They would be distributed. It, and this is how it would be distributed. That green line is the mean. This is like a continuous histogram. This is a normal distribution. It wouldn't be perfectly normal, but we can pretend like it is because IQ is pretty close to normal. So the mean would be 100, and the standard deviation um, is 15. But because there are 56, the mean of 56 children, this is how, this, this is how the distribution would go. Wh the standard deviation in this distribution isn't the distribution of all IQ scores. It's the distribution of the average of 56 IQ scores. And there's a lot less variability in averages than there is in individual IQ scores. So the standard deviation here is only two points. It's very small. So with these children, their IQ is 97.3 it's actually a decent chunk below what we would expect 56 children's IQ to be if they were randomly selected from a population where everybody's IQ was distributed normally. So we look at the area right here and we ask ourselves what's the probability if we sampled 56 people from this whole population here what is the probability that we would get a mean of 97.3 or lower. So we need to know the probability of this or lower, which is the area under this little curve. And that's where distributions come in. Turns out that probability is 0 0.089, so 8.9%. So there's, so if we just sampled 56 children randomly from the, n the population of people who have no brain damage, who don't live near toxic waste, um, about 1 in 10 times, a little less than that, so 8.9% of the time, we would expect that the mean would be 97.3 or lower of the IQ of those 56 children. So there you go, there's probability. Now, whether that's enough for you to say, oh my gosh, the toxic waste is affecting my babies or not, that's, uh, stats can't help you too much with that. That has to be like a judgment call of how, how scared should you be. But 
the probability helps us figure this stuff out. And, and understanding probability helps us interpret this. Okay, so the, m the, m the basic molecule of probability is a random process. And by random, I mean something we cannot predict. Everything is probably caused by something. But if we have no way to predict that, like you, if, you, if you can't predict where the die is going to land when you roll a six-sided die in a game, then it's random as far as you're concerned. That's what random is. It's unpredictable. So if there's a random process, something we can't predict, that could end a certain number of ways, but we're only interested in some of those ways, one or more of those ways, then that's probability. So let's say the random process is rolling a die. Let's say, oh, what if I roll you know, a two or something? Well, there's all these possible outcomes. For, so for a die, there are six things that could happen when you roll it one time. You could get a one or a two or a three, etc. And let's say we're only interested in, okay, let's say three. Let's say this is a one and this is a two. So you say there's six things that could happen. I'm only interested in maybe it turning out to be a three, because that's what I need to beat this guy at risk, because he's occupied Kamchatka or whatever. So this is random, and this is probability. Us trying to figure out uh, the likelihood of this green one happening among all of them, that's probability. And so probability is always the probability or, or the number of ways that one outcome can happen, the outcomes we're interested in, well, it could be multiple outcomes, but the number of ways that our outcomes of interest could occur, like rolling a three, divided by all of the ways all of the outcomes might happen. So it's a part divided by a whole, and that always gives you a proportion. So that's probability. Um, and remember that the whole includes the outcome of interest. It's not three divided by the probability of a one, two, four, five, or six. No, it's the, it's the number of ways a three can happen divided by all six ways that anything can happen. So that's probability in a nutshell. A bunch of things could happen, and we're only interested in some of them. So the number that's associated with probability, the likelihood, is the number of ways our outcome can happen divided by the number of ways everything could happen. So what's the probability of pulling the ace of spades from a deck on one pull? There's 52 cards. So 1 divided by 52 is 1 in 52. Pulling the 4 of diamonds, also 1 in 52, because there's 1 4 of diamonds. Um, what's the probability of getting heads on one toss of a coin? You know this, right? It's 1 half, or 0.5, or 50%, however you want to express that. It's more common to use the proportions among mathematicians and statisticians, but we sometimes switch around and use the fractions, and ratios, and stuff like that. So what's the probability of randomly choosing the name of a female out of a hat, including the names of paper with the names of all the students in our class? Well, we'd have to figure out how many females there are, right? So let's say there's, I don't know, uh, 28 females and 4 males, then it would be 28 divided by 32. That would be the probability. The shortest of 4 matchsticks. Well, there's one shortest matchstick, and there are four matchsticks, so it's one in four. So we need to talk about certain kinds of outcomes. You're talking about a random process, and certain things could happen, but there are different kinds of things that could happen. There are things called disjoint outcomes, sometimes called mutually exclusive outcomes. That means if one of them happens, then the other ones can't happen. So you can't roll a die one time and get both a one and a four under normal rules. You can't simultaneously be over 40 and be age 40 or younger. You can't simultaneously pass the test and fail the test, except in some weird philosophical martial arts way. But in, in universities, no. You, it's one or the other. You can only have one of these things happen. You can't have an IQ of 100 and also have an IQ of 120 at the same time. And then there's my joke about cats. So. These are disjoint or mutually exclusive outcomes, and the rules of probability are different for those than they are for um, outcomes that are not disjoint. So let's talk about the rules of probability. Let's say you want to know the probability of drawing a jack out of a deck of 52 cards total on a single draw of one card. The number of ways that can happen is one. No, it's not. It's four. There are four jacks, right? So are these disjoint? So is drawing one jack a disjoint, a disjoint event from drawing the other jacks? The question is, can you, 
can you, if you draw a jack of hearts or a jack of spades, can you draw a jack of hearts and a jack of spades the way this question is framed? I think I've ruled it out by saying on a single draw of one card. So you can't have the jack of spades and the jack of hearts at the same time. So these are disjoint. See. So the number of things that could happen that we would be interested in, four things could happen. See, there's four jacks. And the total number of possible things that could happen when you draw that card are 52. And since they are disjoint events, 4 divided by 52. 0.077. So almost 8%. What's the probability of winning a raffle if you have 10 tickets? Is winning a disjoint outcome for the 10 tickets? Think about that for a minute. So the number of things that could happen is 10. And they are disjoint because if ticket number 1 wins, that means ticket number 2 didn't, the way most raffles work if there's one winner. And if ticket number 3 wins, wins then then none of the other tickets won. So the winning of any of those tickets is disjoint from the other tickets winning. So they're mutually exclusive, which is I prefer instead of disjoint. Disjoint sounds like a broken nose. So 10 out of 500, your probability is 0.02, much bigger than 1 out of 500, which everybody else would have if they only bought one ticket. So what's the probability of randomly selecting? Yeah, this is, this is a good one. Okay, that's silly. Um, what's the theoretical probability of the person you meet next, uh, the person next to you, or the next person you meet having the same birthday as you? Now, this is where probability gets weird. If you born, if you assume, which is not true actually, that all people are born equally distributed, people are equally likely to be born on any day of the year. It's not true, but if we assume that, then you can say, I only have one birthday, so the probability that the next person I meet will have my birthday is one in three sixty-five. And all the possible birthdays are, are disjoint things. There's only one thing, but you can't have one birthday and another birthday. So we're dealing with disjoint type stuff if it's only a single person. Now, this is where it gets weird. If you change the frame of the question, you've suddenly changed a lot. What's the probability of any two people in a group having the same birthday as each other? That's a very, very different question. Now, in some ways, this is no longer disjoint. I mean, we're looking at two people having the same birthday each other. Now, one person can't have two birthdays, but two people can have the same birthday, right? So conceptually, it tricks you, or it tricks a lot of people. So this is actually the probabilities. The probability of the next person you meet having your birthday is like this. So let's say there's a group of people, and you say, what's the probability of the next person I meet having my birthday? It's this teeny, teeny probability. Or if you say, what about a group of 50 people, what's the probability that at least one of them will have my birthday? It's much bigger, but it's still only like one and a third percent or something. It's, it's pretty small, maybe one and a half percent. However, the probability of any two people having the same birthday in a group of 50 is well above 95 percent. And in fact, it's quite, uh, quite a bit higher than that because people aren't born evenly distributed. So if anybody ever bets you on that, go ahead and take the bet. You'll probably win. The probability is above 0.95 for that. And that's because you have all the possible matches. You have to check yourself against every person, every person against every other person. There are so many ways for that to happen that as the number of people in the group gets bigger, the probabilities increase ridiculously. You're doing pretty good if you get up to like 40 people in a group. But if you get 50, I mean, you're golden. It would be odd for you to lose. I mean, of course you can, but... So three rules of probability. The OR rule, which is the addition rule for disjoint outcomes. And there's also like a general rule for disjoint outcomes that I'm not assigning, or for non-disjoint outcomes. Uh, there's the AND rule, which is the multiplication rule, and the NOT rule, which is the complement rule. Um, they're not all in your text. I think you can figure that out at some point. But the complement of a number, the probability of something happening is a certain number. The complement is 1 minus that certain number. So there's weird notation. You don't have to use all this notation. Just remember, the probability of something happening is something like 0.3, then the complement is 1 minus that. So 1 minus 0.3 is 0.7. Sometimes we use tilde to mean not. So not A means um, not A, which is the same as A, A, A C, which is complement. Um, so if the probability of winning the raffle is 0.20, then the complement, we can use math and say 1 minus 0.20 is 0.8. But 
you can also do it a more diff uh, a more easy way. You could list all the possible outcomes as like a one bar chart in your mind. You could say 20% of that bar chart chart is the way I could win. Well, the complement is everything that's not in there. It's everything else. So it's 0 0.8. So it's just whatever part of 1 or 100% is not already included in the thing you're talking about. So the math works too. 0 0.8 is just 1 minus 0 0.2. So the complement is just everything that's not what you're talking about. It's the leftovers. So the multiplication rule says that for two things, there for two events, the probability of both of them happening is equal to the individual probabilities multiplied by each other, A times B. This is for independent events, so it's important to know and be able to recognize events that are independent versus those that are dependent on each other. So you need a, for this to work, you need at least two outcomes, and they cannot be disjoint. So because it doesn't make sense, what's the probability on this roll of a die, me rolling a 1 and a 4? Well, the probability is 0 because it's impossible. You can't roll a 1 and a 4 on one roll of one die, right? I'm going to flip this coin. What's the probability of me getting a heads and a tails? It, it doesn't make sense. So this only makes sense for outcomes that are not mutually exclusive. And this form of the multiplication rule, there's a slightly more complicated form. The simple form of the multiplication rule only works if the events are independent. And we'll talk about that. So the probability of A or B, that is the or rule, not and. And is multiply, or is, or is add. The probability of A or B happening is the probability of A plus the probability of B. And this form of the rule only works for disjoint outcomes. Now, there are, there are more complicated versions of these rules that apply to a broader range of outcomes. But for disjoint outcomes only, so like rolling one die, what's the probability of getting a 1 or a 4? So disjoint, a 1 could happen, or a 4 could happen, right? Um, the probability of getting a 1 is 1 over 6. And the probability of getting a 4 is 1 over 6. So the probability of getting a 1 or a 4 is 2 over 6. 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6 is 2 over 6. So 2 6, the 1 third. So think about which rule applies here. I'll pause for a minute so you can pause the video and make your answer and then hear me say the answer. What's the probability that your next mail order t-shirt will be one of the colors of the French flag? I'll tell you the French flag has three colors and they're the same as the United States flags. So what is that probability? I don't, don't necessarily work out the probability, but just think which rule should you use? The AND rule or the OR rule? The multiplication or the addition rule? Um, the answer is or, because these are going to be disjoint things. Your t-shirt's not going to be all the colors. Well, probably. I don't know. We could make a different situation. Um, so it's going to say, we're actually saying, what's the probability that it will be red, or it will be blue, or it will be white? So that's or. So you'd add the probabilities. What's the likelihood that Ron Paul and Joe Biden will end up in a head-to-head -head presidential race in 2016? Here's the key. Now, you can't always go on keywords like this, but here we have an and. So the and says this is going to be a multiplication thing, that they will both end up. So this is going to be a multiplication type situation, that Ron Paul will end up there and Joe Biden will end up there. So we would multiply those two probabilities if we could figure them out. But we're not Nate Silver, so we probably can't. What are the odds of winning lotteries in three states at once? So is this disjoint? Uh, no. You could win in Ohio and Indiana and Texas. So if you won in all three, it would be winning in Ohio and winning in Indiana and winning in Texas. So this is going to be a multiplication situation. The chances of being a victim of at least one kind of natural disaster this year. So this is a situation where you have to reframe it into an and or an or type question. List all the possibilities and separate them with ands and ors. So let's just imagine there's like four kinds of natural disasters and then we could separate them. So at least one fits better with or because you could rewrite that as what's the probability that I will be the victim of an earthquake or I will be the victim of a tornado or I will be the victim of a tidal wave or I will be a victim of a comet hitting the earth. So that's what at least one means. At least one doesn't actually fit 
joining those things with and. So that's going to be an or situation. What's the probability of correctly guessing the answers to three multiple choice questions if there are four options for each question? Now you would need to rephrase this and you would say and. You'd say the probability of guessing number one and guessing number two correctly and guessing number three correctly. So actually we can figure this one out. This is a pretty easy one. If there are four options for each question, then you should know that for each one question, the probability of guessing correctly is one in four. Because since you don't know what the answer is, it's random to you. Like if you have ab I said guessing. If you know the answer, it's not random. Then you're smart and you studied. But if you don't know the answer, then you didn't study enough, and so it's random. It's purely random to you. And so you guess. And if there are four things that could happen, and one of them is what you're interested in, and it's random which one happens, so it's random whether you get it right or not, then it's one in four. So what's the, question, what's the probability of getting the first one right? One in four. And the second one right? One in four. And the third one right? One in four. So you have one-fourth times one-fourth times one-fourth. Uh, so four times four is 16, and that times four is 64, right? So it's one in 64. It's a pretty low probability of getting them all correct. So the summary so far, probability is always a ratio of two numbers, the outcomes of interest divided by all possible outcomes. Probability is always about these outcomes. So if you can identify the random process and identify the outcomes, which ones are the of interest part and which ones are all possible outcomes, and then you divide them, then you're, you're golden. All right, I'm going to stop right there for now and upload this and try and make a different one.